Well, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. I am Amanda Tyler. I'm executive director of BJC, which stands for Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty. And I am so pleased to host and moderate tonight's event, and uh, especially with our incredible very special guests, and I will introduce them both to you in just a moment. Uh, but first, some housekeeping reminders and background information. We are coming to you live tonight on the Zoom webinar platform, and we'll be putting some helpful information in the chat for you throughout tonight's program. So don't forget to check that out. We hope you will send any questions that you would like us to ask our panelists to us through the Q&A feature. We will be monitoring that and asking questions during the second half of our program tonight. And now a little bit of background on BJC and Christians Against Christian Nationalism. Since July 2019, BJC has coordinated Christians Against Christian Nationalism. The project is strongly connected to BJC's mission to advocate for faith, freedom for all. And our experience spanning 85 years now, working in coalition and collaboration with others across lines of theological difference. If tonight's discussion stimulates your interest in broader issues on religious liberty in the courts, Congress, and our communities, we have a variety of resources on faith, freedom for all on our website, bjconline.org. You can learn more about Christians Against Christian Nationalism at christiansagainstchristiannationalism.org. We believe that Christians bear a special responsibility to understand and root out Christian nationalism, not just in its most obvious and extreme forms, but also in the pervasive, deeply ingrained manifestations in our culture, our churches, and ourselves. On the Christians Against Christian Nationalism website, you will find a statement that has been signed publicly by more than 22,000 Christians across the breadth of American Christianity. We also have a number of resources, including past webinars. Our newest resource is a three-lesson curriculum guide released just last week based on a webinar that we hosted earlier this year. I hope that you will download that resource and consider using it in your, with your congregation or small group. Tonight's discussion highlights what I believe to be a crucial piece of understanding Christian nationalism, and that is grappling with white Christian nationalism and its intersections with racism and white supremacy. And to help us do that, we have two of the country's leading thinkers, speakers, and authors on the topic. They have long been in public conversation about this topic, but tonight is the first time they will be in actual conversation about this topic, and they're doing it as part of this lear learning webinar for all of us. So let me introduce them to you now. First, Robert P. Jones is the CEO and founder of PRRI, that's Public Religion Research Institute. He's a leading scholar and commentator on religion, culture, and politics. He's the author of White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity and The End of White Christian America, which won the 2019 Grauemeyer Award in Religion. The paperback edition of White Too Long, which contains a new afterword reflecting on the 2020 election and the January 6th insurrection, was just released yesterday. Jones writes regularly on politics, culture, and religion for The Atlantic Online, NBC Think, and other outlets. He holds a PhD in religion from Emory University, an MDiv from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and a BS in com computing science and mathematics from Mississippi College. Jones was selected by Emory University's Graduate Division of Religion as Distinguished Alumnus of the Year in 2013, and by Mississippi College's Mathematics Department as Alumnus of the Year in 2016. It's great to have you with us tonight, Robbie. We also have Jamar Tisby. Jamar Tisby is the president and co-founder of The Witness, a Black Christian collective that engages issues of religion, race, justice, and culture from a biblical perspective. He also co-hosts the Pass the Mic podcast, and he is the deputy director of narrative and advocacy for the Boston University Center for Anti-Racist Research. 
Tisby is the author of How to Fight Racism and the New York Times bestseller, The Color of Compromise, The Truth About the American Church's Complicity in Racism. Tisby speaks nationally about history, religion, and anti-racism. Earlier in his career, Tisby joined Teach for America and was assigned to the Mississippi Delta Corps, where he taught sixth grade at a public charter school and later went on to be the principal. He received his MDiv from Reformed Theological Seminary and is presently working toward his PhD in history at the University of Mississippi, studying race, religion, and social movements in the 20th century. So Jamar, Robbie, it's wonderful to have you both with us tonight. Um, so I'm going to just jump right in and, and get right into this topic. And as we before we talk about white Christian nationalism, I want to get your both um, your definition of Christian nationalism to kind of give us a little grounding. Um, Christians Against Christian Nationalism defines it as a political ideology and cultural framework that tries to merge our identities as Americans and Christians. But Robbie, what, why don't you give us kind of your framing of Christian nationalism? Well, thanks, Amanda. I'm really, really happy to be here um, with you all. And I'm really honored to be here with uh, Jamar Tisby, um, who is just such a luminescent uh, kind of beacon uh, in this space. And, um, and, and so it's the first time we've actually been in kind of an interactive conversation like this. I'm, I'm really thrilled about that. Um, uh, and uh, I'm from Mississippi, uh, so we've got the Mississippi connection uh, get going as well. Uh, I, I may muck up your question a little bit, Amanda. Um, I, I really have trouble, you know, I think in theory, there's a difference between white Christian nationalism and Christian nationalism. Uh, in the U.S., it has almost always been white Christian nationalism that has been the, the thing that we're talking about, right, in the U.S. and the U.S. context. And it, it really, it, I think it just comes down to um, something as simple as this, is um, white Christians having um, this very deep-seated idea that America is really their own private promised land, meant for them, uh, and uh, divinely uh, so, right, divinely per, uh, set out by God, right, to be a kind of European Christian uh, a promised land. Uh, and, and, and so I think that, that deep idea, um, it, you know, when I hear the word Christian nationalism, uh, that's what I think of is, is this, this ma it's manifest destiny. We can talk about this more. It's the doctrine of discovery uh, that, that is the version of Christianity that lands on these shores. So it's not an American invention. Um, it's actually something that, that comes uh, to this part of the world with the first Europeans that, that, that set foot here. And we're, and we're still sorting that out, I think, and trying to disentangle um, this dominionist uh, version of Christianity uh, uh, from, from the faith. That's great. Jamar, how, what would you, how do you respond to that? And, and really my role as moderator tonight is to get out of the way and let you all talk in, in, to each other and, and with each other and, and to help inform us all. So, so Jamar, go ahead. Yes. Um, just to echo, I'm, I'm so grateful to be here. So grateful to be in this space, virtual though it may be with uh, such um, important thinkers and leaders uh, in this space. So appreciate the invite. And I would echo everything Robbie said. I appreciate especially um, the, the historical portion going all the way back and saying, you know, this has very, very uh, centuries old um, origins. And I also believe the, the BJC has worked with uh, Samuel Perry and Andrew Whitehead, and they're the authors of the book, Taking America Back for God. So they have um, helpful definitions and categorizations. One of the things that they say in um, their understanding of Christian nationalism is that Christian in this case represents more of an ethno-cultural and a political identity um, that's talking about religious affiliation, cultural values, race, nationality. So, so Christian nationalism becomes um, sort of a bucket <laughs> for a lot of different factors and characteristics. But what I find helpful as we, we think about this um, concept of Christian nationalism is what it looks like in practice, right? Uh, so, so we can define it in various different ways, but it's also one of these things that we should be uh, trained to know it when we see it. 
And that look that manifests itself in various ways. For instance, uh, the American flag in the pulpit, right? Um, the uh, the the it, with the previous president, you could go on social media and see these memes of a European looking Jesus hovering over the White House when, you know, that 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 person got elected. Um, the massive celebrations of the 4th of July at church, as if it's part of, you know, sort of the liturgical calendar. Um, it's also the views of the Constitution. Like, I think there's some really interesting research to be done on the um, sort of the hermeneutical lens that people carry with uh, the Bible and sort of a fundamentalist literalist interpretation and the way they have similar views of the constitution in a fundamentalist literalist, unchangeable, almost divinely inspired kind of document uh, that you don't mess with and um, is, is almost co-equal with scripture. So for me, it helps to, to think about those kind of real life day-to-day -day manifestations of Christian nationalism as well as defining it. I'm really glad that you gave those examples. And, and that's really part of the project of Christians Against Christian Nationalism is to help provide some definitions, but also to help try to be able to spot it when we see it in our in our everyday lives. And and some of what you talked about there, Jamar, talks about symbols and language. And, you know, that's important to sustaining both Christian nationalism and racism. And sometimes these symbols can be blatantly offensive, you know, and really obvious to the eye. And sometimes the symbols are more latent, encoded in both of these situations. And both are really problematic, but in some ways I think the latent ones are even more so because it can be harder to, defect, to, to detect and also easier to deflect, you know, from people who, who then when you point them out, say, oh, you're being ridiculous. How, how could that be a racist symbol? Um, I, I want to give, here's one example that I've, that I've seen and, and one that I know you both are familiar with because it's from the state of Mississippi. You know, when the, when the legislature voted to finally remove the Confederate battle flag from the state flag of Mississippi, um, they did so, but they did, they required that it be replaced with the words in God we trust. <laughs> and this always really bothered me because it's taking a blatant symbol of racism and replacing it with something that's coded um, and more latent. And so, you know, I just wanted to kind of start a conversation here about, about symbols and giving some, maybe some other examples of how racism can be really latent in some, both blatant and latent in Christian nationalism. You steal my thunder, Amanda. Uh, <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking of. <laughs> yeah. As soon as you spoke, um, it was the state flag of Mississippi, and 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 here's what I don't. Uh, um, I'm concerned, folks around the country may not realize or understand is um, symbols have power to shape narratives, right? So so a, a lot of folks are looking at you know the 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 change of the state flag and say, what's the big deal? It doesn't do anything on the ground or concrete. It's just a, you know, piece of fabric kind of a thing, but it tells a story or it helps shape a story, right? So, so um, wrapping up this, this uh, uh, PhD at the University of Mississippi, and I uh, actually live on the Arkansas side of the Delta. So I have to cross state lines to go to school and, 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 on the way to the university and on the way back, I passed this flag four times. And every time as a black man whose commute is literally through cotton fields, and then you see this state flag, the former state flag, which by the way, flew for 126 years. Mm -hmm. This flag survived the civil rights movement, uh, 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 a referendum in the early 2000s, early Black Lives Matter movement. It wasn't until 2020 that it came down, right? And so it has this Confederate emblem. And what does that communicate in the state that has the highest proportion of Black people in any other state, right? Nearly 40%. Then the flag finally changes last year. Yay, great celebration, right? But like you said, they have this provision. It has to say, in God we trust, which I immediately 
interpreted as a sign of Christian nationalism. Why? Because of, again, the power of these symbols to shape narratives. Number one, what's it saying to people who are not Christian or people who don't subscribe to any particular set of religious beliefs? In God we trust, right? And then the other thing, what about the separation of church and state? That's a principle that, that even Christians uh, should, should honor and respect for what it's attempting to do. But beyond that, what the flag is also saying is that what it means to be a true Mississippian, what it means to be a real American is to believe in God. And, and really, they're not saying any, any God or higher power. They're saying the Christian God, right? And then because race and religion have been mutually constitutive in U.S. history, there's also the subtle message that what it means to be a real Mississippi or a true American is, is, is not just to be Christian, but to be white and Christian. And now it's on the flag. And now if you try to take something like in God, we trust off the flag. <laughs> if you thought it was hard to get the Confederate battle emblem off, start messing with that phrase in God, we trust because people are gonna interpret it as you messing with their religious belief. And so it's, it's, it's there, it's there, but what it represents is, is far more than just those few words on the flag. Yeah, that's right on. I'm going to add just a couple of things. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's remarkable. Like, you know, see, I, I think it was 1894, the Confederate emblem went onto the Mississippi, fell, the Mississippi flag. And so if you think about what's going on when that happens, right, it is Mississippi, white Christian, most for the most part, Christian Mississippians, wrestling control back after reconstruction um and it, it it is an overt declaration of white supremacy when that gets put into the flag it is it is a statement by overwhelmingly white christian people in mississippi that this is our state right and don't you forget it uh, is the message to all the african americans in the state uh it's the same reason that most of these confederate monuments go up in the early part of the 20th century uh not in the 19th century um they were part of the edifice of Jim Crow uh, laws being, being um, erected. So symbols, monuments, these are all about, um, I mean, they're literally marking territory. Uh, it's what they're, they're really up to, right? They, they, I think this is what Jamar says, exactly. they do a lot of work. Um, in fact, um, you know, it was very explicit when this group um, that, that was responsible for many of these monuments called the United Daughters of the Confederacy, um, they were very aware of what they were doing. If you go back and look at the records, I spent some time in their headquarters building in Richmond, going through the archives, looking at early records of um, kind of their letters they were writing back and forth about what they were doing and to, writing back to the headquarters. And they were, you know, writing things like, um, you know, that, that one of the explicit reasons they put these monuments up was so that the next generation of children would walk, when they were walking through the town square, would see whose state it was, right? These declarations of ownership by, by, white, uh, by white Mississippians and others all across the South. Um, and I, I think one, one testimony to, for, for people who say, um, oh, you know, what's the big deal? It's just a symbol is exactly what Jamar is pointing to. You will see the, um, the allegiance and the power of those symbols as soon as you try to take them down, right? And that's when, that's when it really shows up. It's like, oh, actually it's not just a symbol. It's not just a piece of cloth. It actually means something that we're not willing to let go of, right, is, is, is what ends up, uh, up happening. I think the same thing isn't true with churches. I, I've just been trying to make a point every time I'm on a conversation to make this point, um, uh, that the, the, you know, every church that has a white Jesus um, uh, in its stained glass has got work to do, right? Um, that this is an explicit racialization of God, Right, um, and it is a statement of power, um, and it's about white Christian power um, again. And and I, I think the the real irony here, I'll end on this note, is that um, so I grew up in Mississippi, um, and the thing I remember on speaking of symbols on the license plates of Mississippi is its motto, uh, the hospitality state, right, <laughs> which um, you know is a little ironic if you know our, if you know our history. But but I think this other point is you know, 15% of Mississippians today claim no religious affiliation at all, um, right? I mean, this is, and, and today, like out in Flowood, uh, out on the outskirts of Jackson, there's a, a very large Hindu temple, uh, you know, out there now, right? I mean, it, it's not just, uh, you know, a, a bunch of Christians uh, in the state. And I, and I think that, that one of the virtues that Christians 
that might be kind of an anti-nationalist virtue uh, is the virtue of hospitality, kind of revitalizing what does it mean, right? And because hospitality is about making space, right? It's about making space for everyone. Uh, and if white Christians could kind of do that, I think that's a real antidote for the kind of nationalist impulse. And I, I think that idea of making space is exactly how what Christian nationalism prevents in many ways, right? Because it Christian nationalism, by its definition, takes up has Christians taking up all the space in the in the American story. And you know, I I tend to agree with you both that white Christian nationalism is really a better moniker for the whole thing, especially in the American context, right? We we talk that there's religious nationalism worldwide in different contexts, but in the American context, really is one in the same. But I will also say that when Christians Against Christian Nationalism launched two years ago, and we said explicitly in our statement that Christian nationalism often provides cover for white supremacy and racial subjugation, that statement got more pushback than anything else in the statement and, and really righteous indignation um, from the detractors, you know, and I, and I know you are both familiar with this response, but I'm, I'm wondering about how what is an effective way to respond to that? I mean, I think some of these examples that we're showing about how some things that that might seem more unquestioned, like the racialization of Jesus and churches and things like that are good examples to try to start to point out. But, you know, any from from your public speaking, from your writing, what what are the responses for those who don't see it? Right. Who for those who can't who or are unwilling to see it or unwilling to admit it, what's a way to engage in conversation to move people? Again, not maybe not those who are most entrenched in Christian nationalism, the ambassadors, in the words of uh, Perry and Whitehead, who have written on this, but those who are accommodators or those who are a little bit further on the spectrum. How how can we engage our neighbors in helping them? understand these more latent and coded ways that Christian nationalism and, and racism interact? Well, I, I, I think that's what's so pernicious about Christian nationalism is for so many white Christians, it's all they know. And it's so familiar that when you call it Christian nationalism, they think, well, that's just Christianity. What are you talking about? <laughs> and, and, and then when you try to, to, to sort of disentangle the nationalist and racist portions from Christianity, they think you're unraveling their faith itself. So, so it's, it's a really complex problem. And it's part of what I call an epistemological ecosystem where multiple venues and concepts conspire to, to form this, this, this web of, of Christian nationalist ideas. And it goes back to things like how the preachers and teachers are trained. Because if you go to seminary or Bible college or something, and they're teaching Christian nationalism, guess what? Guess what's going to come from the pulpit each and every week, right? So, so there's that. And then even at the local church level um, and among the laity, your, 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 your Bible studies, right? There was a, uh, my books are published through Zondervan and um, there, we had to get together as authors of color because they were about to publish essentially a Christian nationalist Bible, you know, um, mm. inflected with all these, you know, America first, you know, America founded as a Christian country kind of tropes and ideas and, we protested. We said, no, you, you, you can't do this. It's not going to be helpful. To their credit, Zondervan said they weren't going to going to um, print those Bibles. Uh, so uh, grateful. But when you got that, like like there's something called the Patriots Bible in people's living rooms and homes. Right. So I'm, I'm just saying this more. Not I don't I, 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 I'm not really talking to the what do we do about it part. I'll leave that to Robbie. But just to just to describe <laughs> how entangled it is. Right. Yeah. Anytime. Um, just to describe how entangled this thing is and how deep it goes. And it's so pervasive that it just seems normal. So now you're coming in and saying that, that the Christianity you understood that maybe you adopted at you know, youth camp in high school and grew up with and teaching your children actually 
that's infused with all these really unhealthy, unbiblical ideas. So it's an uphill battle for sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to make this uh, really personal here. Um, Cause the, the, the world that Jamar is describing is the world I grew up in. Uh, right. Um, where this just is Christianity. Right. I remember, you know, every Sunday um, the pulpit was flanked with the American flag on one side and the Christian flag uh, on the other. Um, uh, went during vacation Bible school as kids, we would assemble out on the lawn uh, and we would have the Christian flag and the American flag uh, out front and we would file and process into the sanctuary uh, with those and we would say the Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag. We would say the Pledge of Allegiance to the Christian flag and we would say the Pledge of Allegiance to the Bible. Um, and these were like ritualized things with symbols and we and you know this is what we did every day uh, during vacation Bible school and that stuff goes pretty deep to the bone when it take when you're taken in um, you know at that level and I, I, I think the tools Amanda are I, I think fortunately we have some of the tools if we'll use them in a different way and I'll just name a couple um, I, I think one so Jamar's you know uh, heading of this organization called the witness um, and to take that, uh, that term, I, I, I think that, that we white Christians have to tell our test, we have to give our testimonies, right? We have to kind of give a different kind of testimony. Like it wasn't unusual in churches I grew up in, Southern Baptist churches, you know, for a Sunday night, for somebody to give up and give a testimony about what God's doing in their life, how their faith is impacting, you know, their, uh, their workplace or their relationships or uh, something like that. You know, I think one practice we could do is have white Christians talk about uh, how they're un disentangling uh, you know, their faith from these assumptions of nationalism. And the other word we haven't really said too much about is white supremacy, um, which is another word that, that I, we just got to get comfortable talking about. Um, you know, it, it's a word that I think many white people recoil uh, from. And, and it was something that, you know, frankly, I struggle with. And so it's in the title of my book. It's there intentionally. But I could say, you know, there were some real conversations um, from marketing people and other people about whether you put the word white supremacy in a book and whether it'd be too off-putting uh, for people to even want to pick it up and read, uh, right? I think we're at a different place now than we were um, when I kind of wrapped the book at the end of 2019. But, um, but nonetheless, I think, you know, giving, um, and, and in some ways, what I tried to do in White Too Long was a version of that, was a version of giving my own testimony of the journey I am still on of trying to disentangle for centuries of white supremacy being just, you know, and, and having Christianity grafted onto and wrapped around uh, these pre-commitments to white supremacy and, and, and just the generations worth of work we have to do uh, to really reform the faith uh, from that 400 year, you know, uh, at least 400 years, probably more than that in history, uh, but, but explicitly we can trace it back uh, to the late 15th century for sure. And I think, Robbie, that's one of the things that's really so powerful about your book is the way you weave in your personal story, testimony, and journey. Uh, uh, um, I think folks really resonate with that. And as we talk about what do we do about folks who have, you know, sort of subscribed to Christian nationalism to whatever degree, I think one of the most important tools that we have available and that everyone has available is their testimony. So, so, so when you're talking to folks who are sort of steeped in Christian nationalism, if you try to start with the facts, the figures, the statistics, even the history, a lot of times there's a wall and, and you can't have a good conversation there. They're, they're, they're too far in. But if you have somehow understood that there's a difference between Christianity and Christian nationalism, there's a story there. There's something that happened. There's a conversation you had. There's a, a, a job you were involved in. There's a trip you took. There's a book you read that, that started to help you see things from a different perspective. I think that's a great starting point for a lot of people is um, to say, listen, this is what I've come to learn and believe. And, and, and let me tell you, I was, I was, I was, I, I thought the same things that you did. 
but here's how and why my perspective started to change. Now, that's not going to guarantee you change anyone's mind, but I do find it, it's a little bit harder to argue ideologically with somebody's testimony, with somebody's personal experience, right? You can disagree with their conclusions, whatever, but if it's a friend or a family member, you're hearing their story, you're hearing their lived experience, and that's a good first step from there. I tend to then move on to history. I think that's one of the things I learned with the color of compromise is, uh, you know, um, the, the, the facts of history are the facts of history, right? And, and it's also verifiable in the sense of if, if we want to, um, you know, refute the idea that civil, the Civil War was just about this sort of abstract idea of states' rights <laughs> when it was really about preserving race-based chattel slavery. You don't have to take my word for it. Go to the Mississippi Articles of Secession, right? Which says our cause is thoroughly identified with slavery, the greatest material interest in the world. Um, and, and so we have, we have these primary resources. The further back you go, the easier it is. Most of the pushback to the color of compromise, which is a historical survey, most of the pushback came once I got closer to the present, to the 70s and the 80s especially, and the rise of the religious right, because now you're getting personal now you got folks who, 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 who describe themselves as Republican. They remember Reagan and Bush and, you know, they, 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 they're on board with all that. But when you start to say, yeah, but here's the Christian nationalist elements of that, then the pushback comes. So just to be forewarned, it gets a little bit trickier the more recent past you get. But you can start to, I think, have productive conversations about how, you know, race and religion um, are intertwined in really unhelpful ways. I think this is really helpful and you're you're really speaking to an audience ready to take some of these actions. I mean they're they're taking a stand as Christians against Christian nationalism and so equipped in many ways to be the the messengers of this message and to and to put their their testimony first and then back it up with some good history. I think is yeah. is really important. Uh, you know, yeah. you both mentioned your really excellent books, and we're going to put in the chat links to how to buy the books um, for our audience here. So we will have those there. Um, but I did want to ask just from your from your writing process and from your speaking process, kind of what you've learned, you know, from the writing process, what you learned about the scope of the problem of, of racism and it's inner and how it's intertwined in American Christianity and in Christian nationalism. Um, and also, you know, what an interesting period to have released your books and for your books to be, you know, received into the world. And, and I'm curious about, um, you know, how interest has changed over the past, you know, from the initial release of the book and how interest has, has, um, has changed since then. And also, and you, you touched on this, Jamar, but what you've learned, I often, from Christians Against Christian Nationalism, I've learned a lot from the pushback or the, or the defensiveness that we get about the project. And, and so I'm curious about what you've learned from, I'm sure, inevitable pushback and defensiveness and, and misunderstanding, intentional and unintentional, that you might have received from your books and your writing. All right, I'll jump in. Um, you know, scope, um, it, it is hard, I think, to overstate um, uh, how difficult, I think, the coming to terms with what the research was clearly telling me was. Um, there were a number of times when I was writing where I, I just literally had to get up from the keyboard uh, and go for a walk because I just, I, I just had to process you know, what I was seeing in front of me. Uh, just a couple of examples, you know, so I grew up evangelical in the deep South. So I knew that Southern Baptists had a problem, right? I mean, that was the world from which I came. It's the, you know, world that I, I grew up in. Um, I did not quite realize how broad uh, the problem went, that it went well beyond the evangelical world, right? Um, that that it, it extended into the mainline Protestant world, uh, which often thought of as the more liberal end of the white Protestant world. Uh, and it extended into the white Catholic world, um, and, 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 and you know, white Catholics have their own history of discrimination as, as many immigrant populations, um, you know, coming over and, and, and 
uh, you know, as recently as 1960, right? John F. Kennedy was facing all kinds of kind of biased and bigoted, um, you know, uh, accusations about uh, going to, you know, be basically a sleeper uh, for the Pope, right? And a kind of a hotline to the Pope and the Pope would be running the country if he was elected president. I mean, that's not that far back there. Um, and, and just a, you know, a couple of examples. So in the, in the, um, in the book, I, I had a, a set of 15 questions um, that I combined this thing called the racism index. that was really measuring um, uh, and one way to think of it is the denials of systemic racism um, uh, and across a whole range of different questions. And so um, if I kind of standardize it uh, to a, those 15 questions and put them all on a scale of zero to 10, um, I was not so surprised to find out that white evangelicals scored eight out of 10 on that index with 10 being the kind of highest denial of systemic racism uh, in the country. Um, but I, I was surprised that white mainline Protestants scored seven out of 10 and white Catholics scored seven out of 10 um, on the same scale, right? And then when you controlled for region, uh, it, it really looked like, okay, yes, white evangelicals were the, the kind of vehicle and the conduit for white supremacy in the South, but white mainline Protestants were that conduit in the upper Midwest and white Catholics were that conduit in the Northeast. Um, and so that I think was pretty stunning to find out. And then to find also, I, the one other point I make is, is that church attendance um, made very little difference uh, uh, in, in mitigating any of these views. And this is always the, uh, the kind of excuse like, oh, these people are just Christian in name only. They're not part of communities. They're not being shaped by sermons and Bible studies and Sunday school and, and all of that. And, and you know, what I found is that overall among white Christians uh, that, that high church attendance and low church attendance look roughly the same um, on, on, these, on these attitudes. And among white evangelicals, uh, it was actually worse than that. Um, among white evangelicals, um, the correlation between holding more racist views um, and identifying as white evangelicals was actually stronger among high attending uh, white evangelical uh, white evangelicals. And 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 just this. And then if you looked at white whites who were unaffiliated, I mentioned that Mississippi, you know, has 15 percent of the country. 15 percent of Mississippi is unaffiliated. That number of the country is a quarter of the country is religiously unaffiliated. And if I looked at whites who were unaffiliated, they were far less racist than white Christians, right? I'm gonna say that again, right? Um, because I think it's really important in, in the scope of things here of how deep the problem is with Christianity. If you, in other words, if you take your average white American and you add Christianity, they move up the racism index, not down, right? That's, that's where we're, and that's controlling for partisanship, education, gender, region, urban versus rural, all kinds of other variables, even controlling uh, for all those variables. That's what it is. And I summarize it in the book. I'll, I'll end here um, with a, um, by saying, you know, so what the data tells you at the end of the day uh, is that if you were a, a, white, a white nationalist and you were recruiting for your cause on a Sunday morning, you would have a higher probability of success hanging out in white church parking lots than approaching whites who are sitting out services in the coffee shops. Mic drop. Oh my goodness. I don't, I mean, the gravity of what you're saying, <laughs> it just, it, it needs to be repeated again and again and again and again and again. So, so, so number one, what can we do about Christian nationalist folks? Go buy Robbie's book, and he's got some incredible data, but also just some incredible narrative to use. So I had the privilege of reviewing his books, a book for the New York Times, and I pulled just a couple of quotes. One, he said, American Christianity's theological core has been thoroughly structured by an interest in protecting white supremacy. Theological core. The, the sort of structured, crafted to protect white supremacy. Then you, you have this other quote, uh, which gets to your point about hanging out in church parking lots. The more racist attitudes a person holds, the more likely he or she is to identify as a white Christian. That should be bone chilling for any Christian person of faith, you know? That, 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 that. And, and what I appreciate about your, 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 your book is, I mean, you were you were just right there with it. <laughs> you, you said you were uncomfortable with the term white supremacy, whatever, but you followed where the data led and where the history told, talked about, and you just laid it out there. And I appreciate it, the forthright way 
in which you did that. And uh, you know, I'm 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 trying to engage in 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 similar work that that says there's something unholy, unrighteous that happens when you combine this concept of whiteness and white supremacy with Christianity. In the Bible, it says any addition to the gospel is, is, negates the gospel. It's no longer the gospel, right? When you add this gospel of nationalism to Christianity, to the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's no longer recognizable uh, as, as the faith of the founder of, of Christianity. So um, that is a critical point to make. And, and one of the things that we got to realize is that the forces of Christian nationalism are way better at telling stories than the forces pushing back against Christian nationalism. They're, 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 they're adept at crafting a narrative, however untrue, however unhelpful. Robbie, I think you had on social media today, the spike in the, the use of the term mm. critical race theory on Fox News. That's narrative. They figured out, oh, this really triggers folks and it really mobilizes our folks. So let's, 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 let's do it again and again and again, have all these guests on, have all these articles, have all this legislation, my goodness, right? And, and we have to, if we're fighting against Christian nationalism, get just as good as telling a different story, a better story, a more truthful story, and a more beautiful story. Well, you both brought up critical race theory at different points, and, and that's a hot topic in the, in the questions that we're getting in. And so I, I just, you know, that, that strikes me, right, that now that's being used as a term, and for a while it has been as an attack line, right? Something that has meant to be something that helps us grapple with racism in a meaningful way is now being turned against and, and used as a scare tactic for people. So what do we do about that? What do we do with the fear that is being tapped into on critical on the on the term critical race theory? How do we who are committed to taking anti-racist action into understanding racism better, what do we do with that? You want to take the first swing at this one, Jamar? <laughs> Very good. Okay, so number the, what's one. What's the narrative, maybe? <laughs> right, what's our right, right. You, you, you made me talk about what are we going to do about all this. <laughs> so I'll make you talk about critical race theory first. Unfortunately, I have had to think about it a lot because, you know, it gets hurled as an epithet at, at me and folks who are in this work. But, and, and, and I got to say, it, it, it didn't start last October when they had... Um, uh, was it was it Chris Rufo on um, Fox News and called uh, then President Trump to put out an executive order banning this kind of teaching? Right. That's when it came on the radar for a lot of people because it entered the political realm. Um, and in November, that 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 executive order was issued. It didn't use the, the phrase critical race theory, but it's using all the same sort of lingo around it. But I got to say, it started years before in far right fundamentalist Christian evangelical circles. And so I can think back to 2014 and 2015 when Black Lives Matter was, was uh, coming on the scene as a national uh, movement. And uh, there's, it, 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 this is the, the sort of transcending race part. There was, a, there was a, a, a black guy, a black Christian who was talking about cultural Marxism and Antonio Gramsci. And that language sort of morphed into the critical race theory once they, once they, once they latched on to that framework, which by the way, they're trying to ban it K through 12. Ain't nobody teaching this K through 12. I was a sixth grade teacher. I was a middle school principal. Critical race theory is upper level graduate school. It's law school that this, this theory is taught. What they're, what they're pushing back against is, is simply the idea of systemic racism. And Robbie, you, you, yeah. you mentioned this before, and I'd love to hear more on it, but that's, to me, a fundamental misunderstanding of the problem of racism when it comes to Christian nationalists is, is it's 
almost exclusively individual and interpersonal. There's no analysis of the systemic or the institutional yeah. uh, aspects of racism, right? So what do you do yeah. about it? Number one, it's a narrative question, right? We are, 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 are too easy to let Christian nationalists dictate the terms of the debate dictate the, the, the discourse on their own terms. So when they say critical race theory is the thing, we don't need to accept that at face value at all. We don't need to say, oh, well, they're, they're saying this is a problem, so let's go and, and research. But there's a place for that, and now it's become so pervasive in the discourse, we, we, we have to sort of, you know, sort of define critical race theory and say why it's not the issue. But, but it, it, we gotta be savvy about this. So when folks bring that up to me, I'll say everything that I just said about how it's not really the, the, the being taught and you know, all that stuff, but then I'll bring it back to Christian nationalism because I'll say what the evidence does show is that Christian nationalism is, is I think threat is, is even too weak a word because it, it's already there. Threat implies some possibility that you might avoid it. It's, it's already within the church, right? So I try to bring the narrative back to Christian nationalism, you know, check the box of, you, you said something about critical race theory because they won't let you go without it, but then say, you know what the real issue is. And last thing I'll say, um, very closely related is, is white supremacist uh, uh, extremist terrorism, right? This is part of what was on display at the Capitol on January 6th in the insurrection. So um, every year, the Department of Homeland Security does an annual domestic homeland uh, threat assessment, right? And, and they said the biggest domestic terror threat was from white supremacist extremists, many of whom are Christian nationalists. So let's talk about that. Yeah, yeah uh, let me just, I wanna just like pause. I think that's that's critically right. I think we, we in many ways are misunderstanding the threats in front of us because we're too, easy, too ready to give Christianity a pass um, because it's the majority religion it has historically been the majority religion. Uh, but if you look at this, at the symbol, like if we look at the evidence right in front of us from January 6, uh, you take your video feed, look at what was there. Yes. Confederate flags. Yes. White supremacists, you know, slogans and symbols, anti-Semitic things like camp Auschwitz, those kinds of things all over the place in the midst of all the Trump signs. Uh, but what was also all over the place were Christian symbols, crosses, Bibles, um, little uh, fish symbols on flags that looked like the Trump flag, the blue, that blue Trump flag, but with a Christian uh, symbol of the fish uh, in, in there. And like, we got to like, not let that go by. We got to take that seriously. Um, you know, those, those people are telling us who they are uh, in, in, in big, you know, technicolor on, on national television. And, and I think far too often um, we've been, you know, we'll, we'll say they're extremists or white supremacists, but the Christian piece just kind of falls off the radar. But I think if we're really going to understand what's animating, uh, you know, this reaction, we got to understand that piece. Um, and then one thing to kind of critical race theory, um, you know, this thing I, I posted today, you're right, that, that just shows this kind of uptick. And, you know, I've seen some surveys also show that this is really only happening on right wing media, right, and conservative media. Like, this is not a debate. There is no critical race theory debate except in uh, like, uh, you know, law schools and, uh, you know, guilds, professional guilds, scholarly guilds. That's where the critical race theory debate is happening. But uh, that's a very esoteric realm of, of, of academia. It's, 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 um, it's not happening uh, across the country among, you know, people. And so this, what this really is, I think it's really the best thing for me, I think is, is there's no point in engaging it on the substance because the substance of it has almost no connection to what actual critical race theory is. Um, and, and, and it has been since the 1980s, right? And it's something that's been around for a really long time. Uh, so the, the current kind of, uh, discourse has nothing really to do with that. Uh, and so if we ask like, well, what, what's it about then? Why now? Uh, and why these people? Who is it and why now? I think we get gets to the heart of it, right? It, it really is, uh, and the way I put it this afternoon, it's a coordinated propaganda movement uh, that's, re that's reacting to a moment, the moment of racial reckoning that we're having in this country. And it's attempt, it's a protectionist move uh, to preempt an honest reading of history. Uh, and I should say not only of the country, but of our churches, all right? Even to prevent us from having an honest reckoning with our own 
uh, histories. Uh, and and I, I think, you know, to call the high ground here is like, no, we're going to tell the truth. Um, and that, 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 that I think if there, there's, you know, one way of thinking about this crisis is um, it's a crisis of white Christians being willing to tell the truth about ourselves and to being tell the truth about our country. And if we care about our churches and if we care about our country, um, we can't think that being too cowardly and too um, uh, self-interested uh, to really look at our history honestly. I mean, that's the only way to help. Here, right? We can never build a healthy future based on lies or based on ignorance. Um, and so this is really a movement, I, 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 or, you know, if we're really talking about what should we be doing in terms of race in this country, we have to be telling a truer story than we've ever been willing to tell. And if, if Christians ought to be about anything, uh, right, it ought to be love and telling the truth. Um, I've, I've kind of tried to boil it down to two things. Like if I could say, like, if white Christians would do two things um, you know, uh, if you want to make the country great again, uh, the, the best things that white Christians could do is to tell the truth and love our neighbors. Uh, and if we'd be willing to do that, um, you know, I, I think we'd see a very different movement than, than what we see from many Christian quarters today. Can I just amen and echo all that? Like, so, so, so what we're seeing is not dissimilar to the rise of the lost cause mythology following the civil war. So, so uh, Robbie talked about the United Daughters of the Confederacy. That is a response to the newfound yeah. rights and uh, empowerment and freedom of black people, right? And so what they did was try to rest the narrative in, in, a, in a way that, that, that preserved white supremacy and, and white power. And the same thing is happening before our very eyes in real time, only it's hyper accelerated because of social media and the news, right? To, 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 to now something that happened just a few months ago, in January of this same year, the narrative is getting twisted by all of these falsehoods. Oh, it was Antifa. Oh, you know, it wasn't as violent as they said. Oh, there was a martyr on, on the side of, of the people, of the insurrectionists. You know, look at, look at how bad uh, the left is kind of a thing. And so it, 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 Brian Stevenson, the, the, the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, put it this way, and I, I always use it. He said, the North won the Civil War, but the South won the Narrative War won it in all kinds of ways from confederate monuments up to you know all of that stuff right and the same thing is unfolding right before. so how do you come that untruth disinformation missing with truth with more truth and one of the things i say even to folks who are are, are christian nationalists they'll give lip service to something like racial reconciliation they'll give lip service to something like racial equality but but that it has to be premised on the truth. And, and, and like Robbie said, as Christians, that ought to be the, the sine qua non, right? Because you can't actually repent and believe the gospel unless you've told the truth about who you are and why you need a savior, okay? And in a similar way, unless we tell the truth about this nation when it comes to race and Christianity, there's not gonna be any repentance, there's not going to be any repair, and there's not going to be any reconciliation. So we have to tell the truth. So, so it behooves us, if, if we want to oppose Christian, get steeped in the truth. Get steeped in the truth, the historical truth, the, the sociological truths, the psychological truths, also the biblical truths. I am far from convinced that people actually understand what the Bible says about race and ethnicity about how different people groups should relate to one another. Here's my big theory. In, in um, the, the, the uh, Protestant Reformation uh, in, in uh, Europe, the big theological doctrine that it hinged on was the doctrine of salvation. Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, not these indulgences, things like that, right? It was, it was that critical theological issue, a bunch of other stuff, but that was, that was the big one. If there's going to be some sort of reformation in the most positive sense of the term in the 21st century in the United States, I think the critical theological issue that it hinges on is the image of God all the way back in Genesis chapter one, where God says, uh, you know, we're made in God's image and likeness. We need to unpack that and we need to apply that to, to, to what it means to live in the most 
uh, diverse in all kinds of ways nation on the planet. Absolutely. I mean, this is you listening to you all is just a masterclass and understanding what's how we're figuring all of this out. Right. And, and when I was listening to you, Jamar, when you were talking about, um, you know, when you respond to critical race theory and saying that's like, that's not the issue, it's Christian nationalism and how Christian nationalism is a barrier to the truth and how it has allowed God and Christianity to be used and to, to be in the way of the truth. And reclaiming that is so important. And at the heart, I think, of what we're trying to do with Christians against Christian nationalism, not claiming a moral high ground for ourselves, but doing the kind of wrestling that Robbie did in his book <laughs> and like what part of this is tied up in our image of God. And, and here, you know, to that, to that beautiful point about going back to Genesis one, how Christian nationalism has turned the image of God into a nation state as opposed um, to a universal being, um, I think is, is just a, a beautiful note. Um, uh, can I add one more point here? Absolutely. Before get on with, yeah. So, you know, Jerome, I don't really thank you for that. It's such a, this line I want to kind of bring back up, right? Is that, you know, we can't be saved without telling an honest story about who we are and why we need a savior. I want to kind of go back to that line, right? Because I got to tell you, um, you know, where I ended the book was really, I mean, the thing that was honestly running through my head as I was kind of trying to kind of come to a landing spot in the book is this, you know, this admonition to work out our salvation, right? with fear and trembling, right? Um, it, it is a work in progress. Um, and we are always trying to tell a truer story, a more honest story about ourselves. It's called confession, right? It's an ongoing Christian practice that we're called to do, right? And that, that's, that's how we work out our, work out our salvation. And I, I think, you know, the, the, the other thing that uh, goes back to your earlier question, Amanda, about um, how do we engage, right? Is that I, I think one place of common ground we can engage on people, even who maybe haven't even set one foot on this path of thinking about you know these things, is to say, look, you know, what we have in common here is that we want a healthy, vibrant Christian faith, right? Um, and and you know, it, what's ironic here is that I think so many people who are wrapped around the flag, their Christianity is wrapped around the flag or the flag is wrapped around their Christianity. And they think, you know, God and country are two uh, kind of phrases that kind of hold together. And I've been to God and country day and uh, the outskirts of Jackson, Mississippi, uh, right on July 4th. So I, I know of which I speak, but, um, you know, often think that that is, um, uh, you know, it's patriotic on the one hand, but it, but it is like the pinnacle of Christianity on the other hand. Right. But um, I think the, the conviction that I've come to is that the only way that white churches uh, in particular are ever going to be healthy, uh, the only way that white churches are going to work out their salvation is to come to terms uh, with the ways that white supremacy has been just infected the DNA of the white Christian church. Right. And, and if that phrase or that thing, you know, kind of re makes you recoil, um, it's worth sitting at the, the phrase I've always said, it's worth sitting with, right? There, I would say like, there was something, it's part of that, I, I had to get at the keyboard, walk away, kind of process. A lot of this was like, I just had to sit with something for a while, right? And I, I think that's also a deeply let the spirit work, right? Because um, there's stuff that I think we're all holding on to that has to get dislodged, right? It's stubborn uh, there. But like, this is all familiar to Christians, right? That there are things that uh, that we're entangled with that for our own good, right? And, and be in right relationship, not only with our uh, fellow citizens and neighbors, but to be in right relationship with God. We can't have our faith wrapped up with white supremacy, right? So at, at the end of the day, I mean, we're about kind of really a healthier, uh, trying to get to a healthier faith by telling the truth. And some of those truths are very hard, but at the end of the day, it's not about beating up the faith, beating up Christians or saying all Christians are stupid racists. Uh, right, but it's about um, trying to work for. Um, uh, you know, I, I I thought a lot about my kids writing this book, right? Um, and and I thought about like what kind of a faith do I want to try to hand down to my kids, right? Do I want to hand down a faith that's still all entangled in all in whiteness and white supremacy and nationalism? Like, no, like that's not the faith. I I want to be the one 
uh, to do that work, right? To do some of that work. And I think our generation, right? It, that is our jobs, right? To kind of hand down a better faith, a purer faith a, with better understanding uh, than the one that we got handed. I know we're over time, but, but my final word is, is, is to say, we have to learn from the black church. So this whole thing has been about Christian national, white Christian nationalism. Yep. Well, the black church exists because of uh, the, 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 the sin and the heresy of white supremacy, right? In, in the sense of we could not find true equality within uh, predominantly white churches that were holding on to white supremacy and Christian nationalism. And so the very historical development and theological development of the black church tradition, which is many and varied, of course, um, but has immense resources already for fighting racism, white supremacy, Amen. ideas yeah. of Christian nationalism. So, so it's one of the ways that racism works itself out is theologically, right? Um, there's, there's theological racism that says, you know, black people and people of color, what their, their thoughts about God are somehow subordinate or inferior to European or white thoughts about God, which is a fallacy we have to combat. And the way we do it is by drawing on the deep reservoirs of wisdom and experience and theologizing that black Christians have been doing since, you know, brush arbors when we couldn't, you know, publicly meet and gather because uh, white enslavers and, and power brokers uh, knew that when you got a bunch of black folks together talking about God, then they're going to get these wacky ideas about liberation and equality and it's going to be a problem, right? And so that's the context in which um, Black Christianity, particularly in the United States, has grown up. So we don't have to start from scratch. Um, so if we're looking at next yeah, no, steps, right. you know, following and learning from, uh, in particular, Black Christians, but, but, but any sort of um, Christians who have experienced some sort of um, marginalization or, or oppression because of, of their identity and the way people have labeled them. Absolutely. And, and I know that that is in the spirit, Robbie, that you were inspired to title your book, <laughs> White Too Long. Yeah. And, 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 James, and James Baldwin. James right? Baldwin is your inspiration. And, and then that inspired us at BJC to start looking at how religious freedom has been white too long. And, and all of this is tied into challenging Christian nationalism um, and getting back to those foundational principles of religious freedom for everyone and what can we learn from communities who have been oppressed and who, from whom freedom has been taken away to understand that better? So um, I just want to thank you both. We could go on for another hour easily. And, and the questions and the engagement that we're getting in this webinar are just wonderful. But thank you both for your work, uh, for your generosity with your time and, and your uh, sharing tonight and, and for being in conversation with us. Oh, thanks for the opportunity. And Jamar, Absolutely. so great to be with you. Yes, yes. Let's do this again. <laughs> and thank you to everyone who's attended. We did record tonight's program and everyone who registered for the event will be getting a link to the recording. We will also soon be posting this in the resources section of Christians Against Christian Nationalism, uh, org, where uh, you can go and share it with others and um, use this as a resource to help people understand white Christian nationalism better. So thank you all again uh, for attending tonight, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Good night.